Okay, it's the 26th of May, 2006. We're in Tarragona with Michaela Wolf from Graz in Austria. Michaela, you're known as one of the most innovative researchers in the sociology of translation. First, is that a fair description, do you think, and what's involved in, in this sociology? Well, I think a fair description uh, up to the point that I organized the conference last year on the topic because I had been working on uh, social issues in translation for quite some years, especially when I was working on feminist translation and on a project uh, we can talk on uh, t talk about later on. But uh, I think the sociology of translation is something which has been worked on by many people before without maybe uh, labeling it, labeling the work as sociology mm -hmm. of translation. For example, uh, for example uh, doing all the work um, as, I as it is done by, on, I don't know, on the statues of translators, on the, mm. the professional uh, issues, like, for example, is it is done in interpreting studies too, or uh, I think there are many issues, uh, or starting with Justa Holtzmentary, with translatorisches Handeln, or I mean, okay, there. Th that was action theory. That was action in, in theory, the but she already mm -hmm. was introducing the several agents involved in the translation mm -hmm. uh, process. So I think uh, there are many points uh, which had already been touched upon by scholars before that, but there was not a sort of I wouldn't call it a turn because this is, seems to me quite exaggerated, and I think thinking in terms is quite easy, but it doesn't really change a lot in the in the in the paradigms of the uh, of of the of the discipline. But uh, I think that it was a bit of it was in in, in the air, I would say, mm -hmm. especially with the works of uh, Pierre Bourdieu because Pierre Bourdieu uh, had been used in many different disciplines as a sort of analytical tool for uh, in various uh, fields such as uh, even architecture or uh, in philosophy and, and in other fields. So I think um, Pierre Bourdieu is somebody who um, can be used in a very uh, prolific and in a very profound way to uh, uh, analyze the translation field um, because he not only, and this is very important for Pierre Bourdieu, Pierre Bourdieu not only sh uh, talks about the, or he doesn't only give us the, the, different, um, uh, the different tools in order to discuss the translational field as such, mm. but, but also this combination between the field and uh, the persons who are working in it, and of course the the texts which are going, which can be analyzed with it, and it is, is especially this sort of interaction between text uh, agents and the the whole surrounding the ambience in which it is taking place, which makes uh, Bourdieu's uh, theory so fascinating. About uh, but do, do you see Bourdieu as working on texts? No, he is not, no he, he is not working on texts uh, especially, but he takes text analysis as he did, for example, in his, uh, in his work on the literary field in mm. France, uh, that he takes text, text analysis of other people and he includes it into his analysis of translation of, uh, of the literary field. Mm. So this is what, uh, what's, what, what for me seems very important because very often he's reduced uh, just to what is happening outside the text and yes. not what is what is uh, what can be called the, the connection between the two okay. but well, what, no, no, what about your own research what, what projects have you worked on uh, you mean in relation with translation sociology yeah, first. Exactly. yeah. Yes. yeah. Uh, well I focused on translation sociology through uh, a research project on feminist translation first mm -hmm. Uh, which was um, a sort of uh, survey we were doing on uh, the German, on the translators in the German-speaking countries, in order to see 
uh, what was the the status and what was the sort of uh, working conditions uh, for feminist or, or women-oriented translation. And it was very interesting to see, and this is where we already worked a lot with sociological tools, it was very interesting to see that um, there, are, there is a big openness from uh, the part of the publishing houses and the various uh, persons who are involved in this uh, formation of a feminist translation. But in the end, the outcome was uh, very frustrating uh, because uh, women were said more or less, yes, please, do uh, try to posit yourself as a woman translator, mm -hmm. but in a way that it shouldn't be seen. So this is, this oh, really? is, yeah, this is something which was a very interesting outcome and which was, in a, in a way, it was very frustrating. But uh, on the other hand, we saw very well a sort of split up in the field of the, the women translation field. That there are many women who uh, try to more or less uh, uh, obey to the rules which are uh, done even by feminist uh, publishing houses. And on the other hand, there is a quite big field of resistance against this and a sort of very innovative uh, uh, sphere of, of, uh, of women who are working in favor of it. Um, the sociology of translation in this field uh, is, of course, can of course be seen in, in many different levels. One level is uh, the level of the um, uh, of the cooperation of the networking which women are doing in this respect, um, and you can see very well that the difference between the women networking and the and men networking. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the sense of, uh, it is of course a very, very small um, uh, field people, uh, women are working in, but uh, you can see the networking very well and you can see very well the sort of, of, um, um, of struggling they have not only as a translator in order to be seen against invisibility in general, but, uh, but also to be seen as a woman. So this is sort of a accompanied one, mm. one uh, struggle uh, by the other. And um, the sociology in the in the uh, the sociological um, analysis you can do very well in this respect can also be done in the um, in the in the way that uh, you see how they try to shape their translations not only through translation strategies but you see it very well in their uh, in all their paratexts they are producing and the paratexts are of course something where you can very well. Um, uh, follow the sort of construction processes uh, of their uh, of the the woman translation field, mm -hmm. the the different factors which are conditioning this translation field. How long did that take you? That project. That project took me about. I didn't do it alone. I did it with a, a colleague and friend of mine. It took us about two years. Mm -hmm. The project itself. But uh, the surveys and the study on it, and the, to work on the results. But uh, in a way, I, I still, I'm still working on some of the results yeah. of it because methodologically, I can always renew it and with, uh, and redo it in some. some I do still some interviews with feminist translators and okay. publishers. So I'm, I'm sort of following up the story. And how long is that now since you started? There, I started in 2000, oh. six years ago already. Yeah. What about your other work on the Habsburg? Monarchy? Yeah, the Habsburg monarchy is one of my very big projects of the last few years. I wrote my habilitation on it. Um, it is very fascinating because uh, it is quite amazing that the Habsburg monarchy, which uh, consisted at the period in the 19th century of about 50 million people, and of um, 10, uh, 10 to 12, uh, depending on the period, different nations or cultures and languages, uh, there was never translation, it was never been worked on in terms of translation. So I couldn't really find any literature on it. And uh, it was a very broad field and I plunged into it and I found very interesting things, especially as far as the communication uh, between the different, uh, the different nations or nationalities uh, is concerned on various levels. There is one level which is the institutional level 
where you can see the legislation, where you can see the sort of, um, of uh, rules which are governing the communication uh, in, in uh, yes, on, in government, in, in, the, in, in bureaucracy. And there is another one which is even more interesting to be worked on in terms of translation, which is the unofficial everyday life uh, translation. And here, and this uh, was very, uh, very important for my work in translation studies, I uh, saw very well, uh, I sensed very well the boundaries, the, the frontiers of translation and of the, of the concept of translation, because um, translation in the proper sense, uh, used as it is on texts or interpreting, uh, can no longer be used when you talk about communication in this sense, because translation starts already when you talk about, for example, um, bilingual or multilingual persons who are working not literally with translation every day, but they translate by themselves every day when they, when they work, for example, as, uh, I don't know, servants coming in from the province and are working in the met metropole. So um, I very well saw the, 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 the concept of culture, uh, of, of translation, which had to be widened in this sense because it was no longer possible to work on, on uh, translation used uh, as as uh, as has been used, for example, in uh, I don't know, uh, in the in the context of cultures in post-colonial translation, for example, or, or also in, in, in feminist translation. Um, what I found very interesting too was the the interaction uh, of different uh, social strata in this process of translation, because the people who were translating were most of the time people who were not, of, all, of course, not trained for being translators, but they were uh, in everyday life the main factors of the communication between the nations. Um, this was one thing which was very interesting. The other thing was the sort of, and I did my research between uh, after the Habsburg period of 1848 to 1918 to the end of the Habsburg Empire. And what I found very interesting was the development of a sort of, um, of quality in the training of translators uh, because they didn't really have any training at the beginning and it's sort of in different uh, spheres. This was very much, um, I don't say deepened because until the end they were seen as a sort of specialists in linguists, as, in, in, uh, as linguists, but uh, they were given a sort of status in the end which uh, was quite much higher than mm -hmm. it was uh, 150 or 200 years ago. How long has that taken you? That has taken me uh, about six years too, maybe seven years. In parallel? In parallel with the other uh, project and with, with different other smaller things, but it is something which uh, is, is, can never be really uh, worked through exhaustively. I mean, it's, it, is, uh, it is something which, uh, which has to be redone and reshaped uh, according to the questions which can be asked. How did you get into this, into translation studies? Into is translation study is not really my. It is my background in the in the sense that I I studied uh, translation and interpreting uh, in Graz uh, uh, at the beginning, and I finished the studies. But then I worked as it, and I worked as a translator and interpreter mm -hmm. in various enterprises, in various firms in in Italy and in Austria. And, um, but um, I left the field for various reasons, and I was working in uh, in development studies for quite some time. Mm -hmm. I spent quite some time in in uh, countries in the so-called third world, and I I came back uh, to not really to translation studies first. I wanted to write a PhD uh, thesis, and I did it in Italian literature. I was working on uh, a Renaissance author Luigi Pulci, and uh, from this it, I took, I started a sort of, it was not an academic career yet because I, I started then working in a, um, in a project of the uh, European Research Fund, 
uh, of the Austrian Research Fund, and I was working on a linguist and Romanist, uh, Hugo Schuchert, who mm -hmm. I was working through his archives. He was, he was one of the leading linguists and Romanists in the, in the end of the 19th century, which was very interesting because it gave me a sort of access to the cultural history uh, in the academia, uh, in the Euro European academia in the 19th century. And this was a basis for me to focus later on when I uh, started working in translation studies, uh, to focus a lot on uh, historical aspects in translation because I, I brought with me this background. And I saw the translation and the translation paradigms we are, have been working on during the last 10 or 20 years uh, they they very much uh, found, find their basis in the 19th century in the in mm. the in the paradigm mm. which is so um, I came into translation studies uh, at the beginning of the 90s uh, when they were looking at the department of translation studies in Graz there was a new more or less new newly founded department um, and they tried to get people in who already had a PhD, who did some research. And so I started my work in translation studies. And you teach? Yes, I teach. I teach quite a lot. I teach uh, mainly, I um, uh, have various courses uh, for beginners, translation theory, uh, various approaches to translation studies. And I do some other seminars, uh, which are more closely connected to my research area, okay. research areas. And I have a lecture on uh, transcultural communication too, which is uh, very good, very interesting for um, for positing translation studies within other fields too, and the connections with other fields. What, what do you think are the main challenges facing translation studies? Well, the main challenge is, is facing translation studies. Um, for me, there are maybe two main challenges. One challenge is, of course, uh, uh, globalization, in the sense that um, we have to we have a responsibility as a, as teachers of translation, of course, to train students for the world they will be working in. Mm -hmm. But uh, my uh, stance is that we, I don't want only to train them to be fit in this world, but to face it in a very critical way mm -hmm. too. And this is something which I think that in, in, in many ways has been neglected recently in, uh, in, in some uh, programs in, tran in teaching translation. So for me it is very important to, to give them a sort of um, a feeling of uh, where they are, what they want, and how they can not only work as translators in order to, um, to, uh, to, to function in this sort of globalization system, but, but also in the sense that they, they can um, they cont contribute to shaping the different, uh, the different fields they, can, they, are, they are able to work in with, uh, with the training they get in our, in our departments. Um, another problem. challenge for me is um, uh, that I think translation has become a concept or a term uh, which, is, can, which is no longer, uh, and maybe it never has, which can no longer be restricted to the discipline only. But when we realize that translation uh, is a concept in philosophy or in linguism or in linguistics or in, in other fields where, or especially in cultural studies, uh, where translation is used in quite different contexts than it is used in translation studies, I think that uh, we shall we should take this as a challenge to enter into closer cooperation with these disciplines, um, because I think we are we should be the key discipline uh, who sort of um, manages uh, guides the discussion of translation. But uh, we also have to take account of what is going on outside our discipline. And I think in the last uh, 10 years or so, we have been uh, too uh, busily uh, been focusing on, our, our, uh, on the establishing of our own discipline. So I think this is high time to, to look beyond the borders and to, to get in also the, the people who are working on translation in a wider sense and to, to start a closer cooperation with them. Okay, Michaela Bolt, thank you very much. Thank you.